Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be having a discussion. Uh, this is a video specifically about the idea of backing up your games to a computer for the purposes of validation. So, before we get into that, I first want to say this was a highly requested video. I wasn't really necessarily my idea to make this, it's just that a ton of people have been asking for it. Um, and really, uh, this is not a video to show you like, dude, here's how you play the burned games. LOL, don't tell Nintendo. Like, we're, that's not what this is. Um, this is more of an educational tool to explain why I do what I do when it comes to backing up games and how you can do it should you want to. So to first of all explain the reason behind this, again I gotta be very clear, this video will not teach you how to play burned games. That is not what this is. The purpose of this video is just to say you have a disc on some disc based console and you want to back that data up to a computer for whatever reason. That reason can include piracy, I suppose, but it can also have practical applications like, say, using it with ODEs, like the GDMU, the, the RIA for the Saturn, the, uh, the GC Loader for the GameCube, or even modified consoles like a hacked Wii U, a hacked 360, a modded Xbox original, whatever. Yes, those are the practical applications of doing something like that. But if you're really asking me, like, why do I do it? The reason is simple. When it comes to disc-based games, unlike cartridges here that kind of last forever, disc-based games are more flimsy. They die more easily. And especially when you collect them, you'll know uh, that they don't always last that long and they're not always in that great a condition when you get them. So basically, when you've, I'm sure, done it, if you ever look at a disc, you go like, oh, I don't know if I want to get it, it's got scratches on it. Now the reason you're concerned there is because that, even though you've got the game in your hand, the game might be defective because of that scratch. Whereas with a cartridge, you don't necessarily have to worry as much about that type of thing. So if you have a damaged disc, or even a disc that doesn't look damaged, you don't really know the condition of the disc unless you are able to play it, right? So most people will say like, okay, I bought the disc, it's got some surface scratches, but you know, it plays real well, it's fine. You don't know that, you're just assuming that. But there is a way to test it, and that test is actually very simple. All you have to do is take the data from that disc and extract it into an ISO format onto a computer. Basically, if a computer can read every single sector of that disc, you know the disc is fine. And if you're that guy who's like, whatever dude, I bought a game, I don't even care, I played it, I booted it up in the console, it works, I don't need to do that. That's fine, you're completely within your rights to do that, but just because a game boots, doesn't mean the data is all the way functional throughout the entire disc. You could easily get to a section of the game where, oh, that's not true anymore. It damaged for some reason or whatever. Nothing will load anymore. That happens constantly with discs. Um, even recently, I, I took a, you know, like I backed up my entire Wii U collection and I had a minty, fresh Japanese copy of Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage 2 for the Wii U. Literally never played, bought brand new, and that disc couldn't be ripped, it was defective. It just, it happens. It's a thing that happens with discs. So me personally, I, uh, around 20, in the, in the year 2014, I just kind of had this initiative, this desire to go ahead and back up every single CD-based console I had, all the discs to a computer to verify the data. I just didn't expect the concept of ODE, so I kind of did myself a favor down the line. So when the GC loader came out or whatever, all my GameCube discs were already ripped. I could just put them on an SD card and boom, I'm done. So the purpose now is to just kind of go through the various consoles and just kind of give you an elementary understanding of what might be involved. This is not going to be an intricate detailed analysis of every individual console and the actual steps you would need to take. It's just kind of a general overview of each one that's special and the general ones too. But just to give you the basic idea of which rabbit hole do I wanna go down here to try and learn more about any particular console. Cool? So here's, here's where we're starting with. The vast majority of CD-based consoles are actually very easy to rip and don't require anything special, which is the good news. In fact, uh, I believe the PC Engine CD or the TurboGrafx-16 CD is technically the first disc-based video game console. And from that console all the way until the Dreamcast, not including the Dreamcast, but everything from up to the Dreamcast, has the same exact procedure, save for one, just one exception that I'm personally aware of in between. Uh, and that procedure is as follows. All of those discs are CD-ROMs, okay? And basically the same technology that's in a music CD. Now, all you have to do with those, it depends on your goals, 
Um, personally, what I do, which is verse, what I personally do isn't always going to be the thing that you should do or I can even recommend to you because some of it is not really practical for people. It's just kind of the stuff I have laying around that allows me to do this. But I'll suggest alternatives that for you to go down that rabbit hole should you choose to. But again, all of these are CD based, so it's very simple. As long as you have a computer that has a CD ROM drive, a DVD ROM drive, or even a Blu ray drive, hell, you could be that weird guy who's got an HD DVD ROM drive still for some reason. If you're that guy, it's very simple to back up that data. There's software called ImageBurn. It's freeware. You just install it, you run it on any Windows based PC, it will detect that disk and it will back it up into an ISO format. I specifically recommend bin and Q for every single console in that era from PC Engine CD slash TurboGrafx-16 CD up until, but not including the Dreamcast. Again, there's one exception. Now, if you do that, everything I just described, it's very simple, um, but that process, the data you create won't always be usable. And the reason is simple. Older tech tends to like with, to work with older tech. So even though that's what I just said to do, it's not what I personally do. Me, I actually still have a Windows XP PC laying around just for this purpose. There is a so, there's a program for it called CDR Win, like version 4.0 or something archaic. It's, it's literally 20 years old. Um, that software was tailor-made, designed to rip console games of that era. And it does so beautifully. It can individually uh, separate music files from data files. It can create an overall ISO, create an overall bin and queue format, do a, an ISO plus a series of WAV files, whatever you want it to do. It has all sorts of trickery. Um, that is what I personally do. And the reason is simple. It was actually constructed for that purpose of backing up and archiving those games correctly. So for future use, they could be usable. That's why when it comes to things like ODEs, that was actually the best route, even though it wasn't really what I intended. Now that's not to say that you can't rip a game with image burn and have it work. All I'm saying is that wasn't really made for that. It just kind of also does it. So there could be, and I'm not certain of any specific ones, but there could be quirks that come along the way where the disc might say it worked, but it didn't necessarily actually do what you wanted it to do. But again, that depends on your goals. If your goal is just to see if the disc has any damage and you don't care about the data that it creates, Image Burn will cover you just fine on all those consoles. But if you care about the data that's generated, you might have to go through some extra hoops to get that right. Um, that might even include finding things like, you know, I believe in Windows 10, there's a way to, uh, through other software, to basically create a clone of Windows XP running inside of Windows 10. And then from inside of that, you could run, you know, CDR win if you really wanted to do that old school rabbit method. I keep using the term rabbit hole, sorry. Um, but you could do that. And I'm sure there's gonna be people in the comments who say, image burn is fine, just use that. Don't make this more complicated than it has to be. And Again, you could be right, but like I keep saying, CDR Win was actually intended for that, whereas Image Burn just kind of does it. So unless you have ripped every single disc of all time and verified every single one, including playing every game from beginning to end, you don't know any more than I do on that. So all I'm saying is that program was meant for that. So that's why I recommend it, but it's logistically speaking more difficult. Now I said in there, there was one exception in that entire era of like a decade plus of consoles, there's one exception. And that exception is the Atari Jaguar CD. The Atari Jaguar CD is a little unique because its discs are, um, they are CD-ROM based technology, but they tend to be thought of more as music CDs exclusively, as opposed to in, in far, as far as like not even detecting that it has a data ring. Um, it's very weird. If you ever look at the bottom of an Atari Jaguar CD game, it does look noticeably different. The rings on it are very different from most uh, CDs of the time. In fact, I would say different from all CDs of the time that I've ever seen. So there was one method that I discovered that actually does work. So you could rip that, for example, with CDR Win. You could rip it with Image Burn, and the disc would rip, but it's, it's going to be smaller than it's actually supposed to be. And the reason is it's simply neglecting the data section. So if you attempt to burn that data or clone that data, it'll just come out as a music CD. It doesn't really do anything else because this, the Jaguar CD itself does not actually have any disc protection on it. The disc protection is on the disc itself. But again, it's odd. A computer can recognize it. You just need the right software to crack it. And the right software in the case of the Jaguar CD is a software called Clone CD. If you rip it with Clone CD using its own unique uh, .ccd format, 
If you do that with Atari Jaguar CD games, they'll rip just fine, provided there's no damage to the disc. And then the ISO that it generates from there is actually usable on a Jaguar CD if you really want to do that. But again, that's the one exception in that era. So then after that era ends, you enter what we call, I don't know if it would have a term, but I'm just going to call it the unique era or the interesting era of disc protection because after that, most consoles, not all, but most have some sort of individual special trick along the way. And the first one up is by far the hardest, in my opinion, and that's the Sega Dreamcast. And I know people tend to laugh at that because everyone typically thinks of the Dreamcast as this like easy to crack console. You, know, you could play a burn games. What are you even talking about? LOL. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, trust me, I know what I'm saying. I've done an entire video on the whole concept of the Mill CD exploit. It is a convoluted story, but basically it boils down to this. The Dreamcast used its own unique format called a GD-ROM. It is not the same as a DVD-ROM. It is not the same as a CD-ROM. It was its own special thing made just for that console and the Naomi Arcade hardware, which was also Sega's property. Those discs, to this day, 20 years, 21 years almost, since the release of the Dreamcast, have yet to be cracked by a computer. You still cannot put those in a disk drive and have it rip them. That's not a thing. So the way you do it is this weird backdoor. And this is what I do. So there's two methods. Uh, one would be the, the uh, Dream Shell option, which I've never been a fan of, but it is the easier of the two. Dream Shell is a custom OS for the Dreamcast. You can connect via uh, a CF card mod or you know, through the, um, the ill-fated uh, SD card loader that would attempt, uh, connect to the serial port in the back, and that doesn't mean the GDMU. Um, then I, there might be ways to run it through the GDMU. Honestly, I'm not even really sure because I've never really been a big fan of Dream Shell. But either way, it's, it's custom OS software. Once you boot that up, there is actually a, an option right there on the dashboard that says RIP GD-ROM or RIP GD, something like that. And its purpose is exactly that. It, you can put in a disc of an original Dreamcast game and it will rip it from the console to some sort of other data source. The problem is you also have to have the console modified enough to connect it to something that it could rip to. So a CF card mod would, necess would be necessary in order to do that. And that all sounds good. It actually sounds like that would be really easy. It's like, oh, cool, this software exists. The, if I have it modified with like a little SD card attached or whatever, maybe it'll load to that. The problem is I find that more often than not, it doesn't actually work because it doesn't have a very good, it doesn't have a good way of telling you whether or not it actually ripped a file successfully. It'll just kind of go and then sometimes it'll just give up and it won't tell you if there was an error. It just kind of stops. And if it stops, then you have to restart the whole thing. And if it had to stop in the first place, there was probably a reason for it. It just, all I'm saying is it doesn't give you nearly enough information and tends to work less often than it works correctly. Um, so I'm really not a fan of that method, even though it is the far easier method. Um, so the method I use that's vastly superior as far as the quality of results is the broadband method. And already that just scared a hell of a, a lot of you away because the broadband method requires, as it would imply, a broadband adapter for the Sega Dreamcast. As anybody who's into the Dreamcast knows, that is not a common accessory for the Dreamcast. It was released very late into the console's life, only in Japan and the US. I don't think it ever came out in Europe. I'm pretty sure it didn't. It probably came out in Canada too, but that's for regional purposes is just North America. Um, point is that accessory is not common, but it is required for this. So what you have to do is you have to take the Dreamcast, you have to put the broadband adapter into it. Then you have to load up one of the handful of games that support uh, IP configuration. So like Propeller Arena, even though the game never came out, supports that, I think Quake 3 Arena. And then there's just like some other software tools that can do this. You have to go in and manually change all the IP address settings of the console to be compatible with your home network, which also means that you need to have an understanding of home networking. In other words, the ability to connect two computers in your home together and send data between the two. Uh, you need to know how to do that in order for this to work. So you have the Dreamcast configured, you have the broadband adapter, you have it connected, wired up. You then need a very particular piece of Dreamcast software that's called like GD Ripper. There's a couple different versions, I would just recommend the latest, but that means you have to know how to burn a uh, Dreamcast disc successfully, which is another problem entirely because that gets a lot harder the further and further away you get from Windows XP, so we're not even gonna go into that, but let's just assume you know how to do it. Boom, you need that. So you put that in your Dreamcast. The Dreamcast recognizes that disc, and then it says, okay, 
here's your IP address, here's all this stuff, now I'm waiting for information. So at that point you open up the disk lid and you put in the original Dreamcast GD-ROM disk and you close it. The Dreamcast will kind of spin it up and it'll just kind of wait there for instructions. At that point, you have to go to your computer and you have to open up a web browser or some sort of FTP software and you have to plug in the IP address of your Dreamcast to whatever you said to. Generally it's like 192.168.0.98 or whatever number you decide to make it or it could be uh, 192.168.1. whatever because the last two the last numbers always represent the individual item in your network and then the other numbers tend to customize based on what kind of router you have and stuff like that. Um, sometimes it'll be completely different like you know I think a lot of Apple stuff uses like 10.0.0.1 or and so on and so forth. but again, if you already understand networking then you're not confused and if you're not following along, it's because you don't know networking and this method is not for you. Um, but anyway, if you have that all set up correctly, you basically plug that into the, the computer and it'll basically send a ping over to the Dreamcast. And the Dreamcast will send a ping back, basically just containing information. And that information will be like, okay, here's all the raw files that are on the Dreamcast disk that you have inside me, what do you want to do? And then you can go ahead and you, what you need to do is save every single individual file one at a time, which can sound tedious, but it's actually not because most Dreamcast games actually only contain, um, there's four like sub tiny files that are part of the software. And then there's like usually three big ones. Um, usually like something called like dot raw, uh, like image dot raw and image dot bin and stuff like that. Sometimes it can break up to be a lot more, but at the most I've ever seen was like 20. It's, it's not like, you have to grab individual JPEG files or something like that. It's just, it's tedious, but it's doable. And what it'll do is you just say, save that file like you would out of any you know file off the internet, basically, off of a web browser, and you save it into a folder on your computer. And once you have all the files, boom, you can do whatever you want with that data. But again, if it has issues reading the disk, it may not be the most informative about what the reason is for that. The, the way you'll know it worked is honestly, like once it's all told, once it's told you it's done, a Dreamcast file, a, a, a game, a complete GD-ROM dump will always be exactly the same file size, 1.1 gigabytes. And it actually has a um, uh, the bytes, this, the byte size listed out on the web browser and you can actually match that with the individual file if you check. If those two file sizes are exactly the same, then you know the file worked. From there, <laughs> you can do whatever you want with that data. Um, you can convert it into a mil CD format, which we'll talk about in a second, or you can just dump that onto like an SD card and run it through the GDMU. That is a valid Dreamcast install. I told you, Dreamcast is difficult. Um, so back in the day, how did people burn all these games? What are you talking about if they had to do all that? Yeah, they had to do all that, but then the next process was they had to convert it into what's known as a mil CD format. See, the Dreamcast used three formats. It used music CDs for music CD formats. Uh, it used GD-ROM for games, but it had this third one that was not used much officially called mil CD. It was actually just another way of sending data to the Dreamcast, and its main purpose was like to make karaoke enhanced discs for the Dreamcast or make music CDs with some line of data that's enhanced for the Dreamcast, you know, that kind of thing. People figured out, though, there was no write protection on mil CD. So if you took GD-ROM data and converted it into a mil CD format and then burned that, then the Dreamcast would read it. That's a gross oversimplification, but that's basically how it went down. That is actually the thing that allows the Dreamcast independence scene to continue because people can continue to make games for it using that. And that's, that's cool. But those games, anything like a mil CD disc, whether it's something that came out back in the day like Game Shark or one of the Bleemcast discs, granted the Bleemcast discs are unique, um, or something that comes out now like one of the indie games, those do not get ripped through that method. For that method, you have to do something completely different. We're going back to our computer. You can do this, once again, this is best recommended on Windows XP, although I believe Windows 7 can still do this, but I, I found the results to be more likely to work with Windows XP. Uh, if you get Disk Juggler 4.0, which again, that's software that's at least 20 years old, but it works best for this purpose. Disk Juggler 4.0 is just some software that basically just extracts an ISO from a disk onto a computer. That's all it does. But uniquely, it keeps the boot sector intact on a Dreamcast mil CD disk, meaning that it's perfectly cloning that data and creating an ISO that will perfectly work uh, most of the time. There's some cases where like you have to configure something just a little differently, 
But for the most part, that's the method you're going to use to back up any sort of uh, unlicensed game or anything that's running through the mill CD exploit. Doesn't work 100% of the time, but I'd say like 99% of the time, that's the way you're going to do it. There's only a couple of oddballs like the Blamecast discs, which are their own special case. Um, but for the most part, that's what you're going to want to do. I told you Dreamcast was complicated. That is by far the hardest one throughout history. There's nothing else even close to how difficult that one is. After that, it starts to get a little easier for a bit. The, uh, the Samsung or Toshiba Nuon, the Nuon, uh, as well as the PlayStation 2, believe it or not, are both ridiculously easy. Um, for whatever reason, they didn't put... I, I'm, it's not so much Nuon that I'm surprised by, but... The PlayStation 2 having like no disc protection is actually very surprising. All you have to do is take uh, with the PlayStation 2, if you have a, um, it's, it's a little different depending on which type of PS2 disc you have. There's the DVD-ROM discs and then there's the CD-ROM discs. The easiest way to tell which you have is to look at the bottom. If it's blue, that's a CD-ROM disc. If it's either silver or like goldish, that's one of the DVD-ROM discs. If you have those, all you have to do is stick it into any PC, it can be Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows XP, doesn't matter. Um, and you can run image burn with that and it'll just back up that data to an ISO, no problem. The only, there's only a couple of little oddities to note about that, which is the blue ones should rip as a bin and queue. That's how they're recommended because they're actually CD-ROM based tech, not DVD-ROM tech. Um, the vast majority of PS2 games though, You'll just want to use like a stock ISO format, no problem. It'll know what to do. Image Burn's a smart program. The only ones that I ever had some issues with were the dual layer PS2 games, which are very uncommon. I think like got one of the God of Wars and like Yakuza 2 um, actually exceed in their dual layer DVD discs. I remember having some issues with that, um, but it still would work eventually. You just kind of had to tinker with it a little bit, but those are few and far between as far as exceptions. And back to the new one, same process. You just throw that into image burn, you tell it to clone, boom, it's done. Um, so those are easy. After that, we start getting into like every single console has some special little method. So uh, next up would be the GameCube. Actually, forget the GameCube for a second. We'll come back to that. Let's just handle the original Xbox. Original Xbox is not something you can rip to a computer directly. Um, what you have to do with an original Xbox, the easiest method possible is to modify an Xbox, which is actually really easy. There's software's way, software ways to do that, and then there's mod chip ways to do that. And depending on how extreme or not extreme you want to go with it, you just have to do a basic modification because once you've done that, um, most operating systems now for the original Xbox will actually include disc ripping software. And even if it doesn't, you can install that yourself very easily. Um, I recommend putting a bigger hard drive in there than the stock one, because the stock one isn't big enough to rip every single individual game. Uh, not all at once, certainly, but like one game at a time, uh, it should handle the vast majority. But I think there are actually a couple original Xbox games that would not fit on a stock Xbox. Um, but basically what I'm saying is, once the console is modified, it has a very simple method to allow you to rip the data from a disk onto the internal hard drive of the, of the Xbox. Now again, this depends on your goals. If you just want to back up the disk just to see if it worked, you're done at that point and you can delete the data. But if you want that data off of there and you want it onto a computer for your own purposes, that requires an understanding once again of networking. Now, if you know how to do that for the Dreamcast, you'll definitely know how to do that for the Xbox, because for the Xbox, it's actually much, much easier. Uh, typically with the Xbox, once you just plug it in uh, to your network, it'll automatically configure its IP settings for your network, and there's very little you have to do at that point. You just have to know like what an FTP program is, and then just kind of manually set it to that particular IP address, and it should just connect and more or less treat the original Xbox like it's a hard drive, essentially, from a distance. Um, and then you'll be good to go. And then once you see the files on there that are the files you want, you just clone them over to your computer. They, they send them across the network and then you have the files. And then what you do with the files at that point, 100% up to you. But yeah, original Xbox, not too bad. It just requires a certain level of modification. GameCube, going back to that. Uh, you'll see why I, I switched it around. But the GameCube has two methods that I'm aware of. And the more common method is not the one I use. The more common method is people will take a Nintendo Wii and they will modify it. A Nintendo Wii, once modified, uh, has, you can, there's certain software out there that will allow you to rip a GameCube disc and actually a Wii disc 
to the SD card of a Nintendo Wii. And once they're installed on there, you can take the SD card off, put it in your computer, get the ISO off of it, and just kind of continue that process. Funny enough, that is not the process I do. I actually have a completely different solution here, but it is, I guarantee not even one of you out there watching is going to use this method just because it's, it's prohibitively difficult logistically. Um, back in 2006, right after the Wii came out, people figured out how easy it was to crack because it basically was just a GameCube on steroids. And some guy pointed out, he's like, hey, there's this disk drive that LG made. It's just a DVD-ROM drive. Um, it, for whatever reason, can read GameCube and Wii discs. That doesn't mean play them. It just means understands them. When, they, when it's put into the drive, the, the, the disc doesn't tell the drive, like, hey, stop trying to read this. It just says, like, I don't care, and it reads it. So that means you could use it to, you know, create ISOs. So I found that drive back in 2006 online, bought it. It was like 10 bucks on Newegg, no big deal. Uh, just an old IDE drive, just a random thing that somebody found out that this drive could do it. Then somebody else made ripping software. It's called like Wii Dump or something. Hilarious name. Um, 2.1, I think it is. And you take that software and it will immediately recognize that drive, and then you just put in the disk drive, the disk you want, either a GameCube game or a Wii game, close it up, press start on the software, and boom, it'll start ripping it. And provided there's no issues with the uh, disk itself, after a while, it'll be done. The GameCube discs typically take about 45 minutes. Wii games can take up to four hours. It takes a while. But once it's done, the ISO is there, and you're all good to go. And then boom, you have it. That's the method I do, which, is the the hard part is just finding the actual drive once you have it it's easy you know you can either inst install it internally into a computer or what i do actually is it unfortunately uses ide but you just get like an ide to usb converter treat it as an external drive boom i have this external drive that i solely use for gamecube and wii verification which is awesome so not a problem there you can even use that on you can use that on xp if you want to you can use it on windows 7 I haven't tried it on Windows 10, but I imagine it would work just fine. Uh, so that one, yeah, that's not the method most of you will use, but that is the one I do. So that covers most of those. Now we only have a few left. Um, the Xbox 360 would be the next one worth talking about. And only recently did I get the ability to really do this. Well, okay, I take that back. I've had the ability to do it for a few years, but only recently did I understand the second method. There's two methods that I'm aware of. One is the one that I was using, which is you can take an, uh, an Xbox 360 drive, like the actual drive inside of a console, and typically from the original FAT models, and there's specific model numbers you need to look for, and that type of thing. But I got one of those, and then you flash it to a computer. Typically, it's best to flash it, I think, with software called Jungle Flasher. And back in the day, it was better to flash it with Windows XP. I'm sure that's changed now. But basically, once you do that, you could treat this internal Xbox 360 drive as an external drive for a computer. You see where I'm going with this? It sounds kind of familiar to the Wii and GameCube situation, doesn't it? Um, and it basically is. There's special software that was made just for that purpose. So once you put an Xbox 360 disc in it and the computer recognizes the drive, it can just rip it. Where the flaw comes in, other than just having to do all the tedium of getting that all set up, is that the, the drive I use for the GameCube and the Wii is actually an, a, a DVD-ROM drive. Like it's meant to be in a computer. Microsoft obviously didn't want people doing this, so if you take an internal Xbox 360 drive, you'll notice it's not the easiest thing to connect. It's, it doesn't have like a, 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 like a Molex cable or anything like that. It does use SATA, but it's, it's, you, know, you need basically something else there to provide power. Now, a bunch of Chinese companies came up with these little like clone devices that basically act as intermediaries, where you connect it to the drive, and then it connects it from that to a Molex power supply so that you can basically get it all running. I find that the biggest problem with that whole setup is actually the little Chinese thing, which typically, I don't know what other people's experiences are, but mine has not been great. Like most of it, it'll give me so much crap trying to detect the, the drive because of that thing because its power level seems to be like inconsistent or whatever. And even if you get it running, a lot of the time it'll fail throughout the ripping process because the device itself will just shut off for no reason. Um, so that can be really irritating, but that's actually just the fault of the little Chinese clone thing that I've got. Maybe if I replaced it, it would be better, but I don't really need to do that anymore because I have a second method now, which is using a hacked 360 itself. Once you have a hacked 360, and I did a video on this not that long ago, 
you can actually do this the same way you would with an original Xbox, where it now has its own, well, it always had, but now it has a bigger internal hard drive. It also supports external hard drives. And you can basically just use the console to rip a disc directly to one of those hard drives. And once you've done that, you can either network it over like you did with the original Xbox, or if you really wanted to, you could just rip it directly to an external hard drive, which is FAT32 formatted, bring it over to your computer and just clone the data to another hard drive or whatever it is you want to do with it. Either way, that process will work. Um, between the two, it really depends on your goals because one thing I've noticed is if you do the first method for the 360 that I just described, it will generate a complete ISO, which is the full replication of the disk, not only the data, but also the dummy sectors. Little note on what dummy sectors are is some consoles like the GameCube, the Wii, the Xbox 360, and the Dreamcast always have exactly the same file size for every single game, which is not just some like amazing coincidence that that happened. Basically what happens is the disc only needs a certain amount of data for the game. And then after that, it's like, I have all this extra room. What do I do with it? They put in what's called a dummy file, which just fills out all the blank sectors with this other file just to pad it out so that the, the number will always be consistent. Um, if you intend to burn an Xbox 360 game, you need that whole thing, including the dummy sector. Um, but if you aren't going to burn it because it's no longer 2008, then you probably don't care about that. And that's why you would use the internal ripping method to the console, because if you do that method, it just rips the files that it needs. It does not rip the dummy file. Um, however, even that has a backdoor option. You can rip it to the console with just the files you actually need, send that over to the computer, and there's actually software for the Xbox 360 that will take all the files you need and then inject the, the dummy file and create an ISO so that once again, you can remember what 2008 was like and you can burn a disc, if you really wanna do that. Um, either way, that, that console has a couple of options. Then we get onto the PlayStation 3. This one's a little funny because um, this one I, has, as far as I know, two methods, and I'm doing the, le once again, I'm doing the less likely of the two, but only through sheer coincidence. There is a method by which you can rip discs to the console directly. Um, I have literally never done that ever um, because my goal was not piracy in this instance. It was literally just, I just want to validate the disc because um, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't really have a ton of PS3 games. But um, so I was like, I just want to validate the disc. And I found a solution to this completely by sheer dumb luck accident. Um, so what I did was there was a, a time, I think it, once again, it was like in 2014 when I was kind of doing all this disc stuff. I, I was probably up late one night. As I recall, I was trying to like watch a movie on my computer while I sent data across the Dreamcast, you know, whatever. And I was just like, ugh. And I went to grab Back to the Future. I was just gonna watch Back to the Future and I was gonna stick it into the Blu-ray drive on my computer and watch it. And then it, you know, it, it, it kind of showed up and I was like, I don't remember Back to the Future looking like this. And what I, what I had spaced out on is I had actually put the PS3 version of Back to the Future, the game, in that Blu-ray drive. And much to my surprise, once I connected on this, I was like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. This drive just recognized a PS3 game. It actually showed artwork from the game. It showed the raw files. I was just like, what is happening here? And I, I went to check this as like a, a matter of coincidence. I, I plugged it into another Blu-ray drive to see, do all Blu-ray drives read PS3 games? And I just didn't know this. No, just that one. Just that one model for some reason that I had bought back when I got a new computer. I just needed a Blu-ray drive and I just picked that one. Happens to be able to read them. Um, I'll try to put a link to that one in the description because I remember getting on Amazon and that might still be something somebody can attain. But basically, if you have that drive, all you have to do is put in a PS3 game and bring up our buddy Image Burn there and it will rip it to an ISO and boom, your disc is verified and ripped. And it gets even better. That drive, for whatever reason, also reads PlayStation 4 games. I don't know, but it does. And so the uh, same exact process, put the PS4 game in, run Image Burn, boom, ISO created. Yeah, anyway, so you can do that or you can do like the internal ripping PS3 option as we just discussed with PS4. I don't know yet if there's a way to rip to the PS4 internally, but the method I just described to you does work. Um, Xbox One is still an anomaly to me uh, because at this time, at the time I make this video, there is no way that I'm personally aware of to rip Xbox One discs to a computer to validate the install. However, in that console's case, you don't necessarily need to because the Xbox One rips all of its data to either the internal drive or an external drive of an Xbox One 
to be able to play the game. So in a sense, it's kind of doing exactly the same thing. I'm assuming the future solution to that will be when people hack an Xbox One more commonly, and you'll just kind of treat it like we do the Xbox 360 once it's modded. So nothing to say on that. Um, the PS5 and Xbox Series X are not out, so obviously they're not relevant to this discussion. And the last one worth talking about um, that we even is the reason we're having this discussion at all is the Wii U. Uh, the Wii U was this big holdout for me for a long time because it was just so tedious to try and get this to work. But basically, here's what, what you have to do. You ha it's, it uses this mutant version of Blu-ray, which unlike PS3 discs is not randomly working in some drive like that. You have to use an actual Wii U, kind of like you would with a Dreamcast. But in this case, you have to hack the Wii U, kind of like you do in an Xbox 360. Um, once it's hacked, you can install all sorts of apps and software on there. And one of those things is a software called Disk to App. Um, that particular software will allow you to rip a Wii U disk to an SD card that you install in the front of the console. It also allows you to rip it to a hard drive, but for reasons stated in my Wii U modded video, I do not recommend that, so I would just stick with the SD card. Um, once it's installed on the SD card, you can take the SD card out, bring it to your computer, and do whatever you want with the data at that point. You can put it onto uh, a different hard drive, you can delete it, you can whatever you want to do with it, you can do. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is Wii U discs have the potential to be up to 23 gigabytes, but I, I never saw one that big. The closest I ever saw when I ripped the entirety of the Wii U collection that I own was like 19 gigs, that was the single biggest one. Most of them hover between like five to eight gigabytes with some being as low as like 144 megabytes. It's, it's, it's kind of a wide array. Um, so the biggest SD card I could actually get to work on the, on the Wii U in a stable manner was a 64 gigabyte card. I actually had a 128 gigabyte card working on it and it was successfully ripping disks. And I would go to try and install those discs, and it would actually say it worked, but the discs would never actually function at that point. There was something about bigger cards where everything said, oh, this totally works. Yeah, that worked. Yeah, that worked. Oh, you want to play it? Well, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> LOL. That's... I don't know what that's, that was all about, but using a more high-end card at the lower uh, storage capacity of 64 gigabytes seemed to be the sweet spot. Doing that, I was able to successfully rip every single disc. Uh, slowly, I would do like you know, five or six games at a time, and then take the SD card out, dump them all to a computer, wipe the card, bring it back, and start all over again, and just kind of continue down that list until I got through like all 200 physical Wii U games, which incidentally took weeks, <laughs> uh, because the Wii U disk drive is very, very slow. <laughs> it takes a long time. Some games can take half of a day. Like, it takes a long time, depending on the size of the game. So just be prepared for that. In fact, it's the only console I've seen where if you're getting into the rabbit hole, again, I'm going back to that, of wanting to back up all your stuff for the Wii U, more people say, forget ripping it yourself, just download them, because that's actually faster. It's true that's faster, but that defeats the purpose that I'm personally going for, and if you're in the camp of, like, I want to see if my discs work, then you probably don't want to download them, because that defeats what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, that, that pretty much covers it there. So hopefully, if you're interested in this concept of archiving your data, this has been a good starting point for a lot of you uh, on where to go with it. Like I said, for the most part, almost every console out there is easy. There's just kind of individual quirks along the way that change based on whatever goal or ambitions you have for ripping those games. Um, and like I said, by far the most hard, difficult one is the Dreamcast. That's easily the worst as far as like the process goes but everything else is like as long as you kind of get the basics of it you should be able to figure it out relatively easily so hopefully this has been helpful for you guys um and if you came here being like dude where's i want to play the free games why didn't that happen in this video I'm, i told you at the beginning that's not what this was about so sorry but um anyway hope you enjoyed this thank you very much for watching if you could please like comment subscribe check out all the social media stuff in the description follow me on instagram twitter all that i appreciate that as well thank you very much and i'll see you all here